in this session today. Thank you for attending the course as well. This is a new week and we'll have two sessions on today and on Thursday. I would like now to share a few housekeeping rules. As you know, you can choose the language you want to listen to at the bottom of the screen. The sessions are held in English and Spanish. As you know, as you know this is a seven week course that takes place every Tuesday and Thursday. Last week, you had a session with a case study and a TD research session. This week, or the first session, will be on TD research. And on Thursday, we'll be holding a session that includes a quick guide to write for a larger audience. Some general considerations. Please check regularly that your microphones are muted. Attendance will be verified when you are connected. Uh, you don't need to do anything else. If possible, we ask that your cameras remain on during the session. Due to time constraints, and this is more so today, uh, only some questions will be answered in the final 15 minutes of the session, and the rest will be answered by email. The sessions last 90 minutes. Today, and for personal reasons, the case study presenter will go first. Uh, we will be uh, uh, showing a video. So the, quest the questions addressed to her will be answered uh, at another time. After that, we will have the TV presentation. And then we will have 15 minutes for you to ask questions. And the other, the rest of the questions will be answered by email. The sessions are recorded and are posted online on the website uh, within 24 hours. And the reference materials are also included on the website. Please remember the following. Next week will be slightly different. On Tuesday, we will be working in smaller uh, breakout rooms. So we will have the facilitators and their teams. So please uh, prepare items one to five in the concept note. And also please prepare a, a brief uh, slide presentation, two or three slides, in order to share your information with the other teams in the breakout rooms with your facilitators. Please remember to do this for Tuesday. And on Thursday, the groups will be divided according to uh, the topics. So we will have thematic sessions. We are doing this in order to um, address the projects according to their topics. The idea is to improve your uh, research objectives. Also next week, individual participants will be able to choose which breakout room they would like to join. Um, we are doing this in order to, to help you see which projects interest you so that you can join a team uh, as an individual decision maker. Facilitators will also be uh, aiding this process. But please, uh, the idea is that individual participants can actually uh, go over the breakout room list so that they can uh, then join the, the rooms that have the teams they want to join. Uh, there will be interpretation in only in room three, okay? Uh, so that will be the, the English Spanish room. The other rooms will only include Spanish. Today, first of all, we would like, we will be watching the case study video was presented by Professor Mercy Borbor Cordova. She's a professor at the uh, Higher Polytechnic School of Ecuador, and she has wide experience in all these topics. And after that, I will introduce the other presenters. I will now stop sharing my screen. Okay, video. Gracias.
Hayley, please go ahead and share the video. Thank you very much. Hayley. Muy buenos días. Es un placer para mí estar con ustedes Good en morning. este curso de respuesta clima y ambiente para la salud en las Américas uh, y para hacer la presentación de un estudio de casos de la resiliencia en Latinoamérica y para hacer una presentación de un caso de estudio de clima y resiliencia en Ecuador. Latinoamérica en Ecuador. Y hemos trabajado en este proyecto por varios años. Mi nombre es Mercy Barbara Córdoba. Soy un profesor y researcher en la Politécnica Higher School en Guayaquil, Ecuador. The situation of cities in Latin America is very challenging and it presents many opportunities. But in the socio-ecological context of urban areas, uh, we have issues of vital importance for human health and the welfare of inhabitants. In this context, climate change can exacerbate uh, existing challenges in urban life, including social inequality, urban stress, epidemics, demand for social interest, deterioration of infrastructure, degradation of ecosystems. And it's also here that mayors and local governments must make informed decisions to reduce the impact of the pandemic, of the effects of climate change, and so that people can recover. Why? Because they have the competencies when it comes to using the territory, also regarding disaster risk management, when it comes to providing basic services in the health subsystems and in providing food and attention to vulnerable groups. All this is related to the effect and impact on public health. Now I would like to tell you about the process the collaboration process between the Center, Center where I work, which is the International Pacific Center for Disaster Risk Reduction, with a local uh, collaboration with the local municipalities in the city of Durán. And we created a project called Red Clima. This started in 2016. We were, you know, we had organized workshops on geographic information systems, uh, addressing different municipalities, municipalities. El contexto we worked with maps and we have the map chain of our region to understand the context of each city. Then, then we talked to the municipality of Durán and our center and we started working together to uh, you know, uh, develop the problem. We began to develop a methodological process based on the priorities they had and the skills and knowledge of our expertise. And so it was that working between 2016 and 2017 that we finally y desarrollamos la propuesta de resiliencia climática para la ciudad. Pero nos tomó todavía casi un año para completar lo que correspondió a una firma de un convenio de trabajo interinstitucional ¿no? entre el municipio y la universidad que se firmó justamente en el 2018. En este convenio teníamos nosotros también este, roles específicos um, eh, contrapartes específicas, pero también aportes pero financieros de cada uno de ellos. Y así inició el proyecto party. Resclima de Durán en el 2018. Posterior a eso, hemos tenido la oportunidad de trabajar muchos, en muchos otros proyectos, como por ejemplo por el de ejemplo, Sistema de Alertas Tempranas para Inundaciones, que está desde 2019 uh, hasta el 2021, y el de insumo de sistema de alerta temprana para la COVID-19, porque justamente COVID empezó la pandemia y ahora en este momento estamos trabajando con el sistema de alerta temprana para implementación en el año este que, que corre hasta el 2024. La ciudad de Durán es una ciudad vulnerable al clima, como muchas otras ciudades en América Latina. Tiene 300.000 habitantes y está situada en el Golfo de Guayaquil, que es el golfo más grande del Pacífico Sur, y que tiene muchos elementos que tienen otras ciudades. Está sujeto a inundaciones y está cubierta por canales por toda la ciudad 
y en zonas muy bajas, uh, zonas de manglares que fueron degradadas y tiene muchos asentamientos informales donde la mayor parte de la población o la gran parte de la población sufre de falta de infraestructura, uh, tiene bajos niveles de educación, hay niveles de pobreza y de inequidad y las viviendas realmente son precarias. En estas condiciones, las precipitaciones producen inundaciones y eventos extremos como el niño pueden producir inundaciones que afectan directa e indirectamente la salud a través de las enfermedades vectoriales, infecciosas, respiratorias y otras que también están asociadas al calor. Pero, ¿cómo entonces empezamos a hacer esta investigación transdisciplinaria ¿no? en esta ciudad? Básicamente, vamos nosotros a enfocarnos en tres aspectos importantes. El primero es que vamos a interactuar con los y para First eso of all, we vamos a ir generando un proceso iterativo that, y un proceso de coproducción, es decir, trabajar juntos para definir productos finales que son realmente desarrollados por los dos, uh, los varios actores que intervienen. El otro es trabajar involved. con una the ciencia other, usable, una ciencia to, uh, útil, una ciencia que va a resolver un problema específico de el usuario final, en este caso el gobierno local, el municipio o el grupo al cual estamos trabajando. Y para este efecto vamos a tener que utilizar diferentes disciplinas. Por lo tanto, interviene la interdisciplinaridad. Vamos a hacer la primera pregunta para Let ustedes. Ask the first ¿Qué factores question? ustedes creen Which que son relevantes para un acercamiento so entre investigadores y, en este caso, gobiernos locales o grupos uh, locales? Uno, confianza. Dos, first intereses all, comunes y beneficios. Tres, arreglos institucionales. Cuatro, liderazgo y proactividad. Cinco, un marco normativo y de política. tres, los que ustedes creen que son los más relevantes. Entonces, ahora les voy a preguntar, ¿cuál fue el enfoque de este marco metodológico del proyecto Resclima, ¿no? Resiliencia Climática para Durán, que nosotros usamos? ¿No? Tenía diferentes métodos para uh, inter operar diferentes datos. Y aquí, uh, en ese diagrama que ustedes ven, van a ver que en la primera caja, mil, dice multiamenaza, donde analizábamos tres tipos de amenazas, las inundaciones, las islas urbanas de calor y los deslizamientos. En el componente 2, que está en el otro lado de la pantalla, ustedes van a ver lo que es análisis de riesgo y vulnerabilidad, porque nos interesaba determinar dónde la ciudad y sus habitantes eran más vulnerables y cuál era su riesgo a estas amenazas que decimos. 3.000 era luego bien el componente que se corresponde a cómo definimos las estrategias para la resiliencia, pero esto tenía que ser en un proceso participativo, en un diálogo con Actores, y lo que teníamos en el componente 4000 es la Data City, que es básicamente una plataforma tecnológica que nos permitía poner los mapas y la información y datos y los análisis de cada uno de los componentes para poder visualizar un poco y poder interoperar nuestros datos. Con todos estos elementos y en este proceso participativo, nosotros lo que entendíamos al final es que podíamos encontrar algunas y aquí está un poco lo que encontramos um, al final de la planificación found, urbana y adaptación, of the, of the planning, información y conocimiento uh, y también temas de gobernanza y de construcción social. Entonces, nosotros utilizamos issues. un enfoque holístico para el riesgo so, climático que se basa en estos dos componentes, el de la amenaza en este caso climático y el de la vulnerabilidad. Los dos juntos y su interacción me produce uh, uh, el riesgo climático, pero la vulnerabilidad está formada de tres componentes. Uno, la exposición a esa amenaza climática. Dos, la sensibilidad del sistema humano o de la ciudad. Y tres, la capacidad adaptativa que tenía el sistema con respecto a responder a esas amenazas climáticas. Ahí vemos algunos ejemplos de la exposición a esta sociedad clima, la sensibilidad con las personas, del sistema urbano y la capacidad adaptativa con la capacidad de respuesta. Pero lo vamos a ver un poco mejor en el siguiente slide. En este diagrama lo que queremos ver dos cosas es uno, que en nuestro enfoque 
Vamos a trabajar Now, like con información de diferentes disciplinas, pero también vamos a tener que integrar datos de alguna manera y combinarlos y algunos vienen en escalas y formatos diferentes. O sea, por ejemplo, en el diagrama decimos que tenemos la amenaza climática o el peligro climático, pero también podría ser el efecto del COVID acumulado, es decir, varias amenazas. Y ahí están esos tres factores que hablábamos, la exposición, la sensibilidad y la capacidad adaptativa, donde la exposición por ejemplo, que es factores climáticos, tenemos los números de días que hay mucha, mucho calor o mucha precipitación, la frecuencia de los eventos extremos que producen las inundaciones. En la sensibilidad tenemos la demografía, si son niños, si son personas adultas, ancianos, ¿no? también la precondición, ¿no? si tienen algún, este, algún problema de inmunidad, algún problema de discapacidad, entonces eso también es una sensibilidad de la población o de los individuos y de los servicios que tiene la ciudad, como el servicio de alcantarillado, agua potable, de la basura, este, los tipos de vivienda que tiene, y la capacidad adaptativa está más relacionada con los temas de educación, organización y acceso a la información y a la tecnología. Todo eso hace un factor de vulnerabilidad, y esa vulnerabilidad puede ser individual, no puede ser de la comunidad, puede ser institucional, pero que conjuntamente con la amenaza climática o ese peligro que ya lo estamos estudiando de otra manera, nos conforma, nos conforma el riesgo climático. Y ese riesgo climático va a producir impacto, impacto en la salud, impacto en la economía e impacto en las condiciones sociales. El objetivo nuestro era determinar justamente cuáles son los factores determinantes de esa vulnerabilidad y ese riesgo climático en Bien, y en, y en esta lámina lo que vemos es justamente algunos elementos In this slide, específicos de esa disposición, de esa sensibilidad y de esa capacidad uh, adaptativa, donde van a ver ustedes que se tratan de diferentes disciplinas, meteorología, geomorfología, este, topografía, eh, diferentes este, eventos climáticos, mientras que sensibilidad estamos hablando con factores sociales, con factores demográficos, con una estructura de la población, que generalmente lo vamos a ver por censo, mientras que la capacidad adaptativa es una información que a veces se obtiene directamente uh, de las fuentes, como en este caso el gobierno local, o a veces si hay un poco más de fuerza lo optamos a hacer directamente con la comunidad. En nuestro caso lo hicimos mayormente con el gobierno local y en algunos puntos específicos con información que obtuvimos de la comunidad. Lo que nosotros vimos básicamente era que Encontramos que las zonas de mayor vulnerabilidad que ustedes ven ahí en rojo en el diagrama A, básicamente están totalmente correlacionados con las zonas de asentamiento informal, pero también encontramos que justamente esa zona es donde están las poblaciones menores de 14 años, como lo vemos en la primera vez, y básicamente lo que estamos viendo ahí es que los niños están justamente expuestos a problemas de gran vulnerabilidad climática y por lo tanto van a estar afectados con las enfermedades vectoriales, las diarreicas, la respiratoria, y es un esfuerzo que tenemos que hacer para mapear exactamente dónde se encuentra para generar programas de salud pública diseñados específicamente para esa población. Y estos son algunos de los mapas que nosotros obtuvimos, que son estos mapas de riesgo de inundaciones, ¿no? donde están eh, las zonas rojas, son las zonas de mayor riesgo de inundación, las azules son las que tienen muy bajo, y los sencillos y esas marcas corresponden a diferentes tipos de eh, comercios, en este caso, en el caso de inundaciones. Pero también lo hicimos para las islas de calor, que eran las zonas donde había mayores temperaturas comparadas con las zonas urbanas, y ahí lo que comparamos es esas zonas de alta temperatura en la ciudad and we con las, la ubicación de las escuelas para saber cómo estas escuelas, unas públicas y otras no, están expuestas y qué podría pasar en momentos en que se pueda hacer una alerta pues de un evento de calor extremo. Aquí, por ejemplo, podemos ver un mapa de riesgo para islas de calor urbano, donde lo que hemos utilizado son sensores remotos. Entonces, los sensores remotos nos permiten ver justamente una información de alta, de, de alta resolución para saber qué pasa, dónde están las mayores temperaturas. Pero verificamos eso tanto utilizando imágenes satelitales como también imágenes como recorrido 
disponible en el territorio. Y lo que nos dimos cuenta es que la zona que todavía no tiene grande degradación del uso de suelo, donde todavía tenemos zonas verdes o re remanentes de vegetación, tiene temperaturas más bajas que aquellas zonas que son altamente consolidadas y con mucha purificación. Entonces, todo esto hay que entenderlo para poder diseñar la planificación urbana y las políticas que sean adecuadas para una mejor planificación de la ciudad y de los diseños de las áreas verdes, por ejemplo, para poder mejorar el bienestar de la población. En esta lámina, lo que tra hemos tratado de representar slide, es una agregación de diferentes informaciones. Hemos utilizado um, sistemas de informaciones espaciales con imágenes raster que llegamos a una unidad espacial de escala de, de census uh, track, de escala sensual, para poner census, información demográfica, uh, de precipitaciones, uh, de temperaturas, pero también de información de tal manera que haciendo algún tipo de análisis estadístico podemos determinar si hay alguna relación entre algunas enfermedades infecciosas o respiratorias con alguna ubicación espacial de la ciudad, ¿no? Y también hemos hecho series de tiempo para que nos permita ver justamente cómo hay esa variabilidad de las enfermedades, como por ejemplo el Zika y el Chikungunya, que aumenta justamente en la estacionalidad del calor. ¿Qué es lo que hemos encontrado? Que los casos de dengue están relacionados con temperaturas mínimas, ¿no? Por ejemplo, dengue también aumenta con temperaturas de dengue, que el Zika está relacionado con temperaturas mínimas, con la variación de la precipitación y también con la temperatura mínima y que las enfermedades vectoriales, las cardiovasculares y las respiratorias aumentan en años extremos, como por ejemplo pasó en el año 2010 y en el 2015. Toda esta relevancia de factores nos ayuda a identificar sistemas de identidad, vulnerabilidad social, o biofísica so, para luego also, emprender uh, y poder diseñar programas de salud o de promoción de la salud. Ahora, en la ciencia transdisciplinar, uh, estamos trabajando system. básicamente dos grupos, We el grupo de ciencia y el grupo de actores, y luego in, tenemos que trabajar en otros grupos. Entonces, los We procesos are, metodológicos son diferentes, las estrategias para poder relacionarnos son diferentes, y nosotros so, lo que hemos utilizado es diferente Enfoques. Por ejemplo, para trabajar un poco en definir cuáles eran las estrategias con la comunidad y con los actores de gobierno local, se utilizó el pensamiento de diseño, el design thinking, para poder identificar el problema, los factores de la vulnerabilidad y las prioridades que cada uno, cada uno de los actores percibía. En ese proceso de coproducción con diferentes actores, también tuvimos la oportunidad de validar los mapas. Y es interesante ver we were que mucha de la comunidad no entendía bien And el tema de los mapas, it was entonces había que explicar y trabajar un poco más para poder identificar y más bien hacer como well. mapas so we específicos por uh, ellos mismos que podían dar un poco más de información. Entre los resultados curiosos que nosotros obtuvimos es que mientras los funcionarios y los investigadores de diferentes disciplinas a veces preferíamos las soluciones técnicas, la prioridad de la comunidad fue más bien enfocada hacia el poderamiento, la organización social y hacia la salud de su comunidad. Pero bien, habiéndoles contado un poco lo que nosotros vivimos en ese proceso del proyecto Resclima, voy a tratar de poner en este diagrama ¿no? cuál fue el proceso de coproducción que trabajamos acá. Y creo que estos procesos abarcaban estos tres elementos que ponemos ahí arriba. El primero es la gestión del conocimiento aplicado, top, que va enfocado uh, a una solución específica. En este caso, encontrar cuáles son los sitios de más inundación, cuáles son los sitios donde las personas son más vulnerables a la temperatura, ¿no? para lo cual tenemos que utilizar diferentes disciplinas. Luego, el segundo es fortalecimiento de las capacidades. Fue bien importante, porque teníamos que buscar la manera de que todos entendamos. Y encontramos en el sistema de información geográfica una manera común para poder And trabajar todos en, so el mismo, en, la, en, la misma, en el mismo formato, en una misma escala y aprendimos a hacer format, índices para poder 
with the same scale, una variable we learn to create y finalmente, y bien importante, es el tema de los arreglos institucionales y sociales. Estos institucionales que a veces fueron memorandos de entendimiento formales, con transferencias de, de, de dinero, con tiempos específicos, pero también estos arreglos sociales con la comunidad, cuando se establecieron, por ejemplo, los comités de, de, de primeros auxilios o los comités de devolución de riesgos para poder organizarnos un poco en su territorio. Las lecciones que nosotros tenemos ahí es que deberíamos tener una buena gobernanza entre estos actores y para eso es favorable desarrollar visiones comunes, encontrar cuáles son, cuáles son las prioridades que tenemos identificadas, esa capacitación eh, continua y esa extensión, es decir, un acompañamiento este, permanente y finalmente dar esta oportunidad de la voz de los consejos participativos o los comités que vienen de la comunidad que pueden dialogar tanto con los gobiernos locales pero también de la academia puede ayudar a ser un interlocutor. Entonces ahí logramos mejores formas de aprendizaje, de usabilidad de la información y e incluso logramos gestionar procesos de monitoreo para que en algún momento podamos hacer procesos de más evaluación. Al cabo de casi dos años y medio, casi tres años, también pudimos trabajar un policy un informe de política. Porque we lo relevante de todo el trabajo, en este caso brief. con el gobierno local, con la comunidad, Because era poder establecer esto, esta investigación que se tradujo en una acción para generar un insumo para la política, de la ciencia a la política en, esta, en este nexo que tenemos entre el clima, ambiente y la salud. Y en este, en este policy brief, este informe de política, um, nosotros climate, hicimos cinco recomendaciones que están ahí. ¿no? La And una, so que es el tema de trabajar con los temas de reducción de riesgo the y con los temas de adaptación al cambio climático, pero en los planes de ordenamiento territorial. El segundo, que es fortalecer la, la gobernanza institucional y la capacidad social de las comunidades, creando liderazgo, escuelas de líderes, este, organización. El objetivo número tres era incorporar la gestión del conocimiento y la innovación urbana, lo cual se favorece con estas alianzas estratégicas con universidades y centros de investigación local. Y el último objetivo era incorporar en la planificación de la ciudad el diseño del paisaje, los ecosistemas y el tema innovador de soluciones basadas en la naturaleza como un tema de un ambiente sano y de mejorar la salud de la población ¿no? a la vez que mejoramos el ambiente de la ciudad. En este diagrama hemos querido representar un poco también esta visión de la intersectorialidad de cómo podemos incorporar estos datos y hemos mencionado los sistemas de información geográfica ¿no? para poder establecer datos demográficos, los datos de sensores remotos, pero también aquí en el centro, lo que nosotros hemos hecho también es trabajar con el grupo de tecnología, ¿no? el centro de innovación tecnológica, que lo que ha hecho son aplicaciones que han sido utilizadas para, por ejemplo, tomar datos de eh, clima o sea, de, 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 de factores meteorológicos, pero también para monitorear directamente la observación de las inundaciones o de algún evento dentro de la comunidad. ¿no? Esta, esto, esto fue interesante porque nosotros pensábamos que era más fácil de lo que realmente fue, porque no la tecnología no es accesible en todos lados, como uno cree, entonces eso fue una gran limitación. Por otro lado, también vemos que integramos en estos procesos de intersectoralidad los temas de la planificación urbana con estos conceptos de soluciones basadas en la naturaleza, donde lo que buscamos es llevar el mensaje de cómo, recuperando ciertos ecosistemas que estuvieron ahí, podemos hacer de la ciudad un ambiente más resiliente, un ambiente más sano y por lo tanto ayudar a la salud de los pobladores. Y la, el otro elemento que ya lo hemos mencionado y que es es totalmente relevante es justamente este trabajo de los diferentes sectores, municipios con el sector de salud ¿no? con el tema de riesgo urbano que son diferentes niveles y luego también con la comunidad para poder establecer estas acciones que en territorio son bien específicas hay que determinar exactamente qué es lo que se necesita para un vecindario o para una ciudad y fue en ese momento que en el 2020 city. apareció la pandemia point, y no podíamos estar ajenos a esta crisis ¿no? eh, course, global, también uh, con la ciudad out, y inmediatamente empezamos a trabajar 
a diseñar in the city. un so, proyecto que quería right a, right de, definir cuáles serían los insumos que se necesitaría para tener un sistema de alerta temprano para la COVID-19, pero que podía extenderse para cualquier otra epidemia. Y es así que trabajamos en epidemic. conjunto y ahora con otros and actores so como el Servicio Nacional de Riesgos y Emergencia y los Servicios de Salud para poder determinar estos temas de vulnerabilidad, pero orientados a la COVID-19. Y es así que uh, en el septiembre, but, um, en octubre del 2021, en el segundo COVID año de la pandemia, de, so hicimos este proyecto de los insumos para un sistema pandemic, de alerta temprano para la COVID-19. Uh, Entonces, con la pandemia for en el 2020, lo que tratamos de hacer en este so proyecto para definir los insumos para un pandemic, sistema de alerta temprana para epidemia es conocer un poco cuáles son estos so disparadores de esa vulnerabilidad en el contexto de la ciudad, para lo cual tomamos muestras de sangre, hicimos una aplicación so para poder hacer samples, un contact tracing y saber por dónde podían haber las zonas de mayor riesgo, se hicieron encuestas epidemiológicas de percepción y también explorando un poco la salud mental, así como evaluaciones antropométricas para poder definir un poco cómo eran las condiciones y cuáles podían ser algunos factores de riesgo a las personas que, este, que podían tener el, 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 el virus. En total hicimos más de 600 eh, casos, ¿no? todo esto cumplió con los códigos de, los, los, los códigos de ética establecidos ¿no? y los resultados están todavía en proceso de análisis y esperamos muy pronto y esto es solamente un archivo visual de lo que involucraba esto, que también es un proyecto transdisciplinario, donde había todo un tema de tecnología, había un registro, había un diseño de una encuesta, que es la parte estadística, había factores sociales, ¿no? la instalación de un aplicativo, tecnología, ¿no? los temas de, de, de análisis de muestras, ¿no? la evaluación antropométrica que tenía que ver más con los temas y la parte de biología. Entonces todo esto implicaba un grupo de ciencia interdisciplinaria muy fuerte, pero también seguir trabajando con la comunidad a la cual teníamos que invitar como voluntarios a participar. Y como conclusión y como mensaje final, es algunas de las buenas prácticas que podemos compartir en esta transdisciplinaridad en la que hemos trabajado, podría poner estos cuatro puntos. El primero es los arreglos institucionales. And Para I have nosotros ha sido bien importante establecer algún tipo de arreglo institucional, formal o social, ¿no? donde hay estos convenios marcos en el mediano plazo y hay convenios específicos de corto plazo donde se asigna fondo y establece claramente qué es lo que vamos a hacer y cómo lo vamos a hacer. Esto pues cuando el gobierno local nos da mucha claridad, pero además nos ha ido ayudando a desarrollar una dinámica de camaradería, de intercambio, de reuniones periódicas, por lo tanto va creciendo ¿no? el trabajo y la confianza. El segundo es el trabajo e interacción de las redes de conocimiento interdisciplinario. Básicamente somos diferentes grupos de ciencia, ¿no? Entonces también aquí los diferentes grupos de innovación, los, aquellos que trabajan con diferentes disciplinas, ¿no? Nos, eh, nos unimos para trabajar juntos y tenemos que aprender a trabajar juntos. No siempre es fácil al comienzo y tenemos que ir aprendiendo el lenguaje del otro, ¿no? Pero sí mismo aumentamos nuestra capacidad But cuando we vemos que podemos cruzar esa línea del ecólogo al epidemiólogo uh, o al que trabaja line, con la estadística um, o con el sistema um, de información geográfica que es una herramienta realmente que ayuda a integrar, ¿no? Y también cómo ahora incluimos a estos impactos del clima en la salud y esto nos obliga a mirarnos desde una perspectiva temporal y espacial. Por lo tanto, From, vamos a mirar uh, cuáles son esos determinantes ambientales sociales so that we can que van a influir en el bienestar uh, social, de la comunidad. Um, y otro factor importantísimo ha sido la comunicación. Factors. 
pero que tiene que ser un lenguaje sencillo, no aplicable para, eh, eh, para que los productos académicos sean realmente entendidos y aplicados por el personal municipal en este caso, y mucho más si vamos a llevar un mensaje a la comunidad. Esto implica también un trabajo continuo de una capacitación sobre estos temas para que podamos seguir mejorando y elevando las capacidades de estos actores locales. Y finalmente, el poder llevar insumos, o sea, generar unos insumos para instrumentos de política. Generate tenemos que trabajar en aprender policy brief, policies. además so de los, este, los papers científicos que realmente no son de interés ¿no? de los gobiernos locales really de la comunidad, pero los policy briefs, la infografía, este tipo de mensajes para la comunidad, incluso para los niños con juegos, son bien importantes para poder crear uh, esta sensibilización hacia temas como este, los sistemas de alerta para las epidemias, la situación basada en la naturaleza, la información y datos para las ciudades, que es algo que quisiéramos ir avanzando y que es importante para poder to tomar decisiones informadas. Todavía hay mucho por hacer, pero creo que el camino se lo hace andando y There's estamos contentos do, de poder haber but, aprendido um, algo el camino y compartirlo uh, esto con todos ustedes. Gracias. Thank you so much. Got our favorites. Chicken. Your mic is muted. Um, well, thank you, Mercy, for your video and for your case. Can you see my presentation? Not yet. Okay. I'm gonna try again. Hmm. Okay. Bien. Okay. Great. Thank you. I don't know why I can't share my presentation. Um, okay. Thanks, Mercy, again. And now we're going to have the presentation. Um, from Lily House Peter, uh, Peters, Associate Professor of California State University. Gabriela Alonso Janes, Associate Professor from the University of Calgary, and Marsha Lee Valentine, um, uh, who has an MS in uh, Master's in Science and a Bachelor in Technology. And she works in, with Jamaican women in coffee. So I give you the floor, ladies. Mm. Buenos días. Oh. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, buenos días a todos. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Estamos, uh, hablando de este tema de Today, uh, we are addressing this topic of actually uh, doing TD research. And first of all, we'll have Marsha Lee Valentine. She'll focus on science co-production. Next, please. 
So let's have a Zoom poll first. Which of the following best describes TD? Um, which of the types of um, collaborative research that we discussed in session one um, have you experienced more in practice? Interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, or transdisciplinary? Um, I think show the poll. <laughs> um, bueno, uh, so this is something that we often, I think, see and have experienced, which is that uh, the majority of collaborative work that happens tends to fall into interdisciplinary work and um, transdisciplinary research is harder to achieve. Um, I think there's more and more focus as we're seeing with this course on achieving transdisciplinary um, research, but um, interdisciplinary research has tended to be the focus. So it's interesting um, for us to see a little bit more um, about the participants who are here um, and your experiences. And um, siguiente, the next slide. Um, next, please. Oh, this is a, oh, bien. Um, we also wanted to cover a little bit about the previous session um, before we begin the focus today on co-production. And so we thought that we could revisit the definition of transdisciplinarity um, when it's necessary or when it is the right approach and how it produces the most favorable outcomes. So just to review, um, as we're gonna move forward and continue with the theory, um, transdisciplinary research is an approach that really emphasizes integration. And that's one of the things we're gonna discuss today um, across disciplinary fields, as well as the inclusion of more actors um, in the process, especially actors from beyond academics um, or academia and really produces knowledge that is solutions oriented and takes seriously the specific context. And I think we saw that so well um, throughout um, Dr. Borber's presentation today, how important that um, specific context and the solutions oriented approach is to the success of this. And when is this the right approach? Because transdisciplinarity might not always be the right approach um, as it does have many challenges, but when we have high uncertainty about social ecological problems and when these are complex community localized or community-based problems. Um, and here also the outcomes are favorable as we just saw with the case study because they take into account real life social and ecological problems when they are designing the solutions as well as that local context. And they really foster collaboration amongst this wide range of actors who are both from academic research and also from beyond academic research, including policymakers, um, ministers, politicians or policymakers, um, and community members themselves as important actors in these collaborations. And they strengthen relationships um, and hopefully will foster greater trust um, between communities and policymakers, which then is very important for the implementation of the solutions of the decisions that are made to have that trust and to have that community relationship. 
And we actually have um, a second Zoom poll before we begin the, the new information. So Zoom poll uh, two. Um, I'll pass. Oh, great. Um, and this one here asks you um, to just choose one, but um, which of the following descriptions uh, best capture um, transdisciplinary research? Is it collaboration between researchers of different disciplines, um, different disciplines working together to create innovations or solutions um, for a specific problem in common or for a common problem in collaboration with non-academic actors? That's the second choice. And the third choice is um, investigations from a variety of disciplines that work kind of on their own without much collaboration between the disciplines. So please submit um, what you think best represents transdisciplinarity. <laughs> Very good. Um, so almost 96% uh, um, are correct that transdisciplinarity is really about this working together. And we're going to talk more about this today and about the idea of co-production of knowledge and integration um, as key themes. So with that, um, I'm going to pass to Marsha Lee and we could move forward with the slides or siguiente. Thank you. I think for the sake of time, um, the learning objectives are all on their on the website. So I think for us to move forward just so we have time for questions. Um, okay. And then Marsha Lee. Thank you so much, Gabby. Sorry, Lily. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. All right, so we'll just move into um, knowledge co-production. And as we can see in transdisciplinary research, knowledge co-production does form an important part of research that seeks to promote this integration that we keep speaking of. Um, and what is knowledge co-production? Let's start by defining it. It is simply a way of producing knowledge that is based on collaboration between different people to achieve common goals, right? It is action-oriented research with those who use it and the involvement of stakeholders um, who are academic and non-academic. Um, the knowledge co-production process is a collaborative process as we will keep reiterating today, meaning it has engagement across domains and disciplines, and it takes into consideration different methods for the success of um, sustainability research. You'll see that throughout the co-production process that we move from collaboration to framing the problem to knowledge generation and exploration of practical impacts um, for individuals who are affected or stakeholders which are affected. Now, the knowledge co-production process is based on four principles and I'll just quickly um, address those four principles. Um, it has to be context-driven, meaning that there needs to be a clear set of issues that are recognized and are being addressed. And these issues does not, they don't necessarily have to be local issues. They can be national, um, regional, or global issues. And they must consider the various interests and demands of different groups impacted by the issue being addressed in the research. We, in the termination of this context, um, you can ask yourself questions such as, how did the problem arise? Um, how different changing circumstances in the world are affecting the work that is to be done? Who will be affected by the problem and who um, will be affected by the processes and the outcomes of this project? Um, and also who has the authority, this is an important one, who has the authority to enable or restrain actions um, throughout the life of the research and how institutional and regulatory and policy frameworks can affect these issues identified. 
Now, providing the context um, in the initial stage of knowledge co-production, it allows for a clear understanding of the goals, objectives, and outcomes um, by all stakeholders. And we could see in the previous case study that the context was made very clear um, in her introduction. Now, another um, principle is that the co-production process must have an appreciation for multiple ways of knowing and doing. And this is to promote diversity, which Lily will touch on in a few, and inclusion of, as you mentioned earlier, academics and non-academics, government and regulatory bodies, um, communities, and other dimensions of diversity, which includes gender, ethnicity, age, and nationality. Um, it must also be goal oriented, meaning that the, the research problem must be clearly defined and understood by all parties involved. And we could see that this was this is an important part of the process. And the the case study previously indicated that this process took over maybe a year, but it was done. Um, and then this process must be interactive frequent interaction among participants, um, including all players from the initiation stage and keeping them engaged throughout the process. Of course, Sorry, knowledge co-production. Uh, I think we, yes. we have the, I think we have to advance the, the slides. We ah. stop. Oh no, it's fine. It's okay. fine, I'm Gabby. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry about that. So I'm just, just stating the main principles of knowledge co-production before we move on. Um, it must include all stakeholders and then have them incorporate their new knowledge into the decision-making process. Um, we can move on to slide two now. Now, this was a model um, created uh, as a researcher in residence model, which was proposed because as you realize the knowledge co-production process, knowledge is able to reflect a wider range of perspectives and provide insights on issues affecting each group, which will of course be more relevant to um, local, regional or national context. And therefore you can easily translate um, into changes in policy and practices as it is created through this interaction process. Now, this research model, research in residence model was proposed um, based on the premise that um, the researchers in healthcare organizations promote the building of relationships throughout daily interaction. And then through these relationships and immersion in the organization, the researchers will acquire the knowledge of the local context and collaborate with staff members to co-produce research that is relevant and responsive. Um, staff members and the host organization also will have greater ownership of the research and building trust. The research will be responsive to the change in needs of healthcare organizations. Can move on to slide three. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, previous slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, so of course, engaging with a broad range of stakeholders throughout the co-production process comes with challenges, as Lady mentioned earlier, and various challenges exist um, to the effective adoption of the, the co-production process. Um, there are some common challenges and enablers um, related to citizen-centered um, co-production that's co-producing with communities, right? Um, and then these, bar these barriers um, include um, politics, financing and resourcing, um, access and inclusion, relationship building and disengagement. And they're also enablers. So we'll just go through a few of these. We'll realize that where politics is concerned, there can be political interference and un unpredictable political situations um, delaying the project work. However, on the other end, you can use the political structure um, to build on local political agendas once that knowledge is found. Um, when it comes to relationship building, the interaction with the community, 
there may be unfamiliarity with the community at hand because you don't understand their cultures and norms. There can be disrespect for local culture um, based on the approach taken. And then on the upper hand, you can allow for relationship building within the community while doing this work. And then it will also help to harness trust within the, within the groups. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Now, along with the example that Mercy gave earlier, I'll just move on to something else relating to agriculture of how um, the Jamaican women in coffee um, use this knowledge co-production process to drive change within the local Jamaican coffee industry. And we have a common goal of, you know, providing a vehicle for members to um, channel resources, um, to for women to meet and gain knowledge and a platform for women to develop their leadership skills. Because in Jamaica, the coffee industry is in a dire state and there's need to develop programs to allow for um, redevelopment and improvement of the Jamaican coffee industry and the overall policy space in coffee. Next slide, please. So we begin our process um, as an organization. We formed in 2019, but we realized that we did not have a lot of knowledge as it relates to our information or research as it related to women in coffee. And we didn't just want to go in the field and start making a change because we needed to understand what changes need to be made to improve the overall industry because we saw failing projects over and over again. So we firsthand needed to understand what these issues were. So in 2019, we conducted a, a research with 67 women, and this is a pilot research for a larger project that is to come. And we conducted this in different regions across the Jamaica Blue Mountain. Right, and this was to get um, true data on the exam on the issues that existed within the coffee industry. Because, as I mentioned, this information did not exist within the industry. From that research, we then designed a project that allowed us to secure funding for impact. Right. Um, for this research indicated to us really that, and again, it was not known. We realized out in the field during this research, and this was kind of our relationship building with the farmers, being out there, getting to know them, um, understanding their views, and then the surveys are building that trust. And then the surveys allowed us to see what data was there to allow us to make impactful change. So I realized 52% of the women only had primary level education and 30% of them um, had secondary level, level education. And also that 67% of them have never received any training in coffee production. And also that over 70% of these farmers, their family needs were not being met and they were unable to afford the inputs for them to, to improve their practices or to employ sustainable farming practices. Uh, next slide, please. So of course we were in the field. So this is how we use co-production throughout our process. We were in the field, we build our relationships with the local communities. We understood their needs from the local perspective because there are different regions within the Blue Mountain and we needed to understand the challenges within different regions. So we understood their local perspective, their local challenges, we determined that context. And then we build trust with the women because there are cases when they've been approached by other agencies who have promised them improvement in their livelihoods and those does not come to fruition. So we use this opportunity over about a three month period to build that trust with them. And then from the results of the survey that I just mentioned, we created the project that got funding, but it didn't stop there. Upon receiving that funding, we also had sensitization sessions where we engage with the farmers again to find out, okay, we found out that you have not received any training in coffee production. What kind of training do you need? 
So we met with them and they gave us that information. What kind of inputs do you need and utensils do you need? Sorry, equipment is needed um, to, to fulfill your farming practices. And then they mentioned that they needed training in harvesting of coffee, soil management, sustainable farming practices. They mentioned that they needed help with fertilizer and inputs. They needed innovative ways of controlling pests and diseases. So from that information, we went back, we collaborated with um, some field officers, experts in the field in the different areas mentioned, and we also collaborated with the Jamaican Agricultural Commodities Regulatory Authority, which runs the coffee industry board in Jamaica. And then we developed training material to train these farmers. We went out into the field with them, and then we disseminated this training and provide the inputs that they needed. We, throughout this process, we continue to engage with all the stakeholders. And then after the project was implemented, in about six to seven months after, we saw the solutions being implemented on the farms. We saw that production was being increased and the conservation practices were being implemented and farmers were sharing that information with their um, neighboring parties. And this also helped to build some confidence and trust in the Jamaican women in coffee by the farmers through this collaboration. And we are continuing with this implementation of this project in different regions as the years go by. All right, I think we're on a Zoom call. And then I'll pass over to Gabby. All right, Lily, if you could just lead the poll for me, please. Thank you. Um, so this Zoom poll is asking about um, what are the key aspects of transdisciplinary research that were just identified in the case study example from Jawick that Marsha Lee was discussing. Um, and you can choose up to two. So knowledge of the local context, um, constructing or building, relationship building, uh, spe locally specific solutions or um, research and knowledge co-production. So choose up to two of the ones you think were most key. Mm -hmm. Entonces, Gabby. Wow, okay. So tied for um, knowledge of the local context and relationship building, but also we saw strongly um, locally specific solutions and the co-production of, of this research together with the community members. Siguiente. Um, Next slide, please. Gracias, Gabriela. Yeah, Thank thanks. you, Gabriela. Thank you. Good to see everyone. Hola, este, a todos. Este, otra vez, gracias oh. a Lourdes. Hello, everyone. Thanks again, Lourdes and Ana, who are helping us with the interpreting, and Anwar and Haley for the logistics support. And now I'm going to discuss something that has to do with theory but also some of the things that were mentioned in the cases presented and something that is being studied recently is the building of alliances in the science policy frontier that has a lot to do with transdisciplinary work in research. And this has to do with involving a very wide range of stakeholders with different perspectives and work affiliations. And that is one of the issues that researchers face most recently. These building of alliances help um, temper or reduce tension and reach consensus. If you remember in the first session, we discussed 
transdisciplinary research as a way of life, a way of approaching research um, that uh, involves an effort to build a relationship with other stakeholders in a much more horizontal manner. So something that uh, was very, that, that was very significant uh, for me from um, Mercy's presentation was how alliances in, uh, and how governance is important and how this co-production and involving both formal and informal arrangements was very significant. And this is very important for TD work. And Victor Galatz, uh, who is a researcher who, who has a TD work on financial systems and um, he, the intervention of socio-ecological uh, systems. It's a very interesting work. And he calls this, he calls this unexpected alliances because he works with journalists, with very diverse communities, and uh, he includes their work into his research. The next slide, please. Thank you. Something that is also very important and that has started coming up most recently in TD work is equity, diversity, and inclusion. I think um, most of us here are very familiarized with these initiatives for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And this uh, means that community participation in, in research is essential to promote uh, equity in diverse communities. In the global South, we are aware of, of the importance uh, uh, and of how this has always been a challenge for us. So we need to... Um, increase and to, to open up opportunities for participation, prioritizing marginalized communities, communities that are usually not involved in the development of research. As we said in the last session as well, this also has to do with a political side of, of how science is developed and what kind of knowledge uh, has legitimacy. In, in terms of research, and also in connection with the co-production of knowledge is the interest in reaching a, a balance uh, uh, about the ways of being in, in the world, the protocols that we have for different communities to explain uh, social and physical phenomena. And there are different commitments, institutional commitments to diversity. There are researchers stating that these equity efforts sometimes need to be supported by institutions because uh, that is the way to uh, establish genuine uh, equitable relationships and with Lilia Marshallie, we have looked at how institutional structures sometimes restrict the ability of researchers to include different communities, whether it has to do with uh, the allocation of resources or the ethical involvement of, of these communities. So we thought it was important to mention that the basis for this equity, diversity and inclusion um, and issues has to do with the colonial uh, approach, decolonial approach, uh, something that in the South we have been discussing for years. And so we uh, make a distinction between post-colonialism and de decolonial. Um, so the way that we look at our knowledge and our work are as researchers. The references that we have already mentioned from the beginning behind our work, Epistemologies of the South, 
uh, cognitive or epistemic justice. Um, this means that all knowledge in the world is valid and is useful to face global challenges. And in connection with this principle uh, of the fabrics of life as well. Next slide, please. And this as a pillar, um, I think this is part of the uh, co-production process in a team. So when we decide to do a TD work or each of you in your teams, when you're developing a project, you need to have an open dialogue about what equity means for all of you and uh, as well as diversity and inclusion. And so the definition that we suggest and that we use is that this is the definition uh, is that it's a process um, used to systematically examine how differences in sex, gender, race, race, ethnicity uh, intersects with uh, but to create the identity of a person. And so the way we use that in our research is that is a commitment that is periodically reviewed in the work uh, in our research. And of course, also taking into account exchange and work with other people. And also here, the networks that we build for our work also play a significant role. So we, when we say communities, we don't necessarily mean an indigenous community or a rural community, but any group of people who are in the area or the field or the site where you are working, because they are the ones that have the better knowledge about their reality in that place. Lily? Sí, siguiente y otra votación de, de Zoom. Sí. Yes, we have another Zoom poll. Okay. And this question asks, in your opinion, which of the following uh, points is the most important for knowledge co-production? Um, all of the uh, interested parties share the interest and are in agreement with the problems that they are um, facing. The participation of all kind of interested parties begins at the, or starts at the initiation of the study and continues throughout. Um, Sorry. Um, to be um, assured that these processes guarantee um, that there's continuous um, learning together throughout the study and that those responsible for um, political decision making and the communities um, have a, a strong role in the collaboration and in coming up with the viable solutions. So choose one, even though many might sound good, but just your opinion, which All right, if we could show the poll for the, okay. Wow, very interesting, um, two ties here. So we see that um, participation for especially beginning at the, the start, the initiation of the study is extremely important, um, as well as um, making sure that policymakers and community members um, are, are part of this uh, process as well. But as we see, all four of these are important parts of co-production of knowledge. So in that way, it wasn't meant as a trick question, but just to um, start to think about these important pieces. And then we're interested just getting to know all of the teams better and the participants as to what your focus is as well. So, okay, for the sake of time, um, can you get the next slide? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, 
We're going to just finish up. Son 12.15, Lily. Sí, sí, sí. Yo sé. Um, I'll go kind of. It's 12.15, Lily. A couple slides here. So, and we can um, begin when we return with a review of this, but so that we have time for questions. So we want to share some of the key um, components of transdisciplinary integration. And we'll continue to, to discuss this as well as, as we continue on as well as best practices for this um, integration. But we really like this kind of quote here that disciplines must do more than work in parallel. So that's what we might see with multidisciplinarity, which you see at the bottom in that picture is many different disciplines working in parallel. But what we're doing with transdisciplinary research is we're actually getting these disciplines to interact, to communicate, and really to recombine their knowledge to produce new and innovative theories and methodologies and syntheses, which we believe can go beyond what is possible in multidisciplinary or even interdisciplinary um, research. And so from a review of the literature, we've been synthesizing some of the key important components of this integration. And one of that is really focusing on creating common ground. And this is important too, as we are um, <clears throat> working with more diverse actors, including bringing policymakers into the research process, bringing local actors into the research process, as well as scholars from many different research disciplines. Um, as we've been discussing, designing the, the questions, the research questions collaboratively and from the beginning, so not engaging communities at the very end of the process um, or somewhere in between, but actually from the beginning, designing the very research questions together. Um, also learning together and constructing a common language with this diverse team and we've also found in our almost 10 years of transdisciplinary research experience that this learning together and joint work is really critical um, for teams to build these relationships, but also to begin to have a common language that goes beyond or across disciplines um, to be able to really think differently and reframe the problem. Also exploring differences and commonalities in knowledge systems is really important. So getting to know how everybody else in the group thinks how they know the world um, and how they kind of understand the problem. Um, also managing and nurturing internal communication and we'll be speaking about communication plans um, in a future session and developing shared methodologies and common interpretation. So this goes along with co-designing the research questions collaboratively together and then understanding the different types of methodologies that um, teams use or different disciplines might use and coming up with kind of shared um, research methods. So this can be hard work and we'll continue to talk about ways um, to facilitate this, but these are some of the things that are really key to success in TD. Um, next slide, siguiente. And then, okay, so um, I also want to introduce um, one way of thinking about or um, a good system for starting to understand how do we work with diverse data streams in transdisciplinary research. And one of the issues that we get is as we have more and Lili, more. Un minuto, gracias. Okay. Um, as we have more and more disciplines working together, um, we have more and more diverse types of data. And how we actually are able to get these data, right, the interoper interoperability of the data is another great challenge in transdisciplinary science. And so um, there's a really interesting uh, method that has recently emerged called FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And this is a tool that helps teams to better manage and synthesize their diverse data sets. And we saw in um, Dr. Borbor's presentation, all of these different kinds of data from GIS data um, to social science data, people's stories and their anecdotes, qualitative, quantitative, you begin to have these really diverse data sets. And so this begins to really talk about how do we collect and prepare the data, 
How do we store the data? How do we communicate this data? How do the data relate to each other? And so given that um, it looks like with time, we wanna have 10 minutes for questions. What we'll do is um, the next uh, TD session, we will begin here and then continue to build. So in that case, um, vamos a empezar con, con preguntas. Pienso. Gracias. Okay, let's start with the questions now then. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. So we still have a few more minutes to ask questions. We have selected one question for each of the speakers. Les pedimos, les pedimos, por favor, les pedimos, por favor, este, um, please be as brief as possible because as Mercy is here as well, we can ask her a question. Mercy, Manuel Miller asks, which is the difference between exposure and threat? That's a great question. We believe that threat within climate issues uh, has to do with the event's magnitude. And we use, for instance, precipitation in 10, uh, um, precipitation levels, and uh, we also use anomaly as a variable. Anomalies allow us to compare a specific uh, point in time with mean data. So that's a threat. Regarding exposure, we relate what is happening to this event or the population, how the proximity level as well. But this depends on the type of, uh, of uh, object of study. If things are different for different types of uh, viruses, for instance, and this is also related to climate change. So basically, Threat intensity exposure is related to um, proximity, the place and the proximity of the population. Thank you, Mercy, always very clear. Question number two, Lily. On average, how long does a production and TV process take? Uh, for instance, for one of the cases that has been presented. Concretely, with the with the work um, with the coffee farmers, but we have Sorry. a specific question addressed to Marshall Lee, actually. Um, All right. Oh, yeah, the, the length of time that it took to build the relationships with the the coffee. Yeah. Sure. So it took us about maybe. So we're still building that relationship. Um, so it took us about, for the field survey that we did, that process took about four months. However, once that pilot study was done, we continued engaging with the farmers. And each time we go out in the field to either visit the farms or execute training activities, we continue to build that relationship and we continue to get information from them. So it depends on, from my experience, the information you want at what time. And then the, it's, it's all based on your timeline also. Like how much time do you have to do your research? But you, with a proper written project, I think you can go in and get out in like two to three months based on your approach with the community, because there are challenges, but then you have to have plans in place to address those challenges that you might, might face when you go in these communities. For us, our relationship is ongoing and we continue to build that data to continue to improve the industry as these challenges are also changing with time. Not sure if that answers your question. Bien, gracias, uh, Thank you, Marshall. Uh, now, one more question, and it's up to you who answers the question. Uh, why do at the EDI definition we exclude the economic, social, and political aspects? Yes, EDI. I don't think it's excluded. I think 
there is an emphasis on access inequality and also when it comes to legitimating knowledge. We have structures because we, we are academicians that validate knowledge, okay, and this is included in the IPCC. A challenge when it comes to integrating indigenous knowledge is that there is no uh, documentation protocol or they don't have a protocol that is similar to ours. So, so this knowledge is not excluded, let's say, but rather it shows uh, the problem of unequal access to knowledge. Thank you, Gabriela. And one more question, the last one, which is much more specific. And it reads, Andrea Lobardo would like to know which surveys were used, also how the platform you used to send out the surveys, and what was the participation percentage in the surveys as described by Marshall Lee? Thank you. Thanks for that. Okay, so we use the questionnaire format. Um, we designed questionnaires and we had we had been sponsored 10 Salesforce licenses. Um, that's a customer relationship management platform. We were awarded 10 free licenses under the Salesforce nonprofit package. And that's how we designed the questionnaires. Um, we did not send the questionnaires to farmers because based on where they're located, they may not have access to the internet. So this was part of our relationship building where we all, as board members, self-funded, went out into the field and engaged with the farmers face-to-face. -face. So in that sense, we had 100% participation because all farmers that were approached, they were very receptive and they were appreciative of us coming out there because the roads to get to the farms in the Blue Mountains are horrific. Um, I had to come out my car at one point and ask someone else to drive it for me because I couldn't, I couldn't trek um, to work to the location. So they were very appreciative of us coming out in the field. Um, so we engaged with them face to face. We used our tablets, used the Salesforce platform to enter the information in the database, and then we used that to analyze the data also. Bien. Great. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for uh, uh, how you have, uh, how well you have managed our time. Thank you for the excellent presentations, Marshall, Lily, Gabby, and Mercy. Uh, uh, your presentations have been excellent. Thank you to our interpreters as well. That uh, it's no easy job. And thank you to the 104 participants that joined us uh, and are still here with us today. Uh, we have only had three people um, getting this disconnected. This has been truly successful. Thank you to everyone and we'll see each other again on Thursday. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Carlos, for moderating this session. Thank you.